Welcome to the talk by Dr. John Esposito and have Islam and the challenge of liberalism in the 21st century. So it's hugely timely topic and we have a world renowned scholar, Dr. Esposito is the expert on Islam and Christian Muslim relations. And the topic is very timely in terms of challenges we have seen at home and abroad internationally. So this is mainly organized by the Center of Islamic and Arabic Studies. You can learn more about the center by just finding our website. It's easy to Google CIA S S D S U, then you find our center. So we have one more event I would like to inform you, it is April 28th by Professor Tariq Mesud, Lessons from the Arab Spring, Egypt and Tunisia. Tariq Mesud is coming from teaching at Harvard University. So tonight we are grateful to all of our co-sponsors, including the School of Public Affairs, the Hansen Chair for World Peace, Department of Political Science, Department of Religious Studies, Department of Economics and Language Acquisition Center, LARC. We are especially grateful to the College of Arts and Letters, and I would like to invite Dean Norma Bouchard to have a few words. I'd like to thank uh, Professor um, uh, Kuru for uh, this wonderful introduction. And I don't want to take uh, too much time, but I would just like to say a couple of words about the Center for uh, uh, Arabic and Islamic Studies. As I'm sure you are aware, uh, the center was established in uh, 2000, so it has a fairly long history. Thank you. It's uh, an interdisciplinary center, and its primary mission um, it's a large mission, is of course uh, teaching, research, and community engagement and public outreach. Uh, as an interdisciplinary center, um, it encompasses uh, a fairly large number of faculty, uh, both affiliated faculty and core faculty. Uh, we're very excited uh, about our speaker tonight and uh, of course uh, bringing up the center to its next level of success. So I thank you all for being here. Again, I don't want to take too much of your time and I will um, call again to the podium Professor Kuru, who heads the center, who's going to introduce Dr. Esposito. Thank you, Dean Bouchard. So it is impossible, literally impossible, to summarize the scholarly achievements of Dr. John Esposito, who is also a public speaker, a public intellectual, who has contributed much on world peace and Muslim Christian understanding. We deeply need these days for a long time. I will just touch upon some important publications that you can refer after this talk. So John Esposito is Professor of Religion and International Affairs and also University Professor and Professor of Islamic Studies at Georgetown University. He is the Founding Director of the al walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding in the Walsh School of Foreign Service, also at Georgetown. He is the past President of the American Academy of Religion and the Middle East Studies Association of North America. Esposito has served as consultant to the U.S. Department of State and other, many other international organizations and agencies. He has received honorary doctorates from several universities and his books and articles have been translated into more than 50, uh, 35 languages. Dr. Esposito is the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of more than 45 books including Islam and Democracy after the Arab Spring, the Future of Islam, Islamophobia and the Challenge of Pluralism in the 21st Century, Who Speaks for Islam, What a Billion Muslims Really Think, 
unholy war terror in the name of Islam, the Islamic threat, myth or reality, Islam and politics, makers of contemporary Islam, Islam and democracy, and Turkish Islam and the secular state, the Gulen movement. Please join me welcoming Professor Esposito. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'd like to I'd like to thank your your dean for inviting me and Ahmad uh, whose work I, I've known for quite some time and I'm glad to have an occasion where we had some time to be together. This is a very unique situation for myself. Being somewhat solipsistic and narcissistic, it's terrific that you're looking here and I have the same thing right in front of me throughout the lecture. So no, that's okay, leave it there. I, I like that. I like the that. That's pretty good. It's one of my better shots. Okay. Um, when you have my nose, it's, this one is not a side view, so I'm in, I'm in good shape. Okay, so I'm going to presume no background to what I'm talking about so that I lay some groundwork uh, as I move to some of the more important points that, um, that I would like to make. Let me begin by trying to place Islam in the broader context of the world's religions. There are 2.3 billion Christians, 1.6 million Muslims, so Islam is the second largest of the world's religions, 1.1 billion Hindus, 500 million Buddhists, about 14 million Jews, and about 23 million Sikhs. Usually when we talk about world religions, we don't include the Sikhs, but I think the Sikhs are a large enough number that, uh, that, they, uh, that they should be, and they are a significant uh, minority within the U.S. In contrast to when I got into the field in the late 60s and 70s, when Islam was virtually invisible and Muslims were invisible in our landscape, not that Muslims weren't here, but people didn't see Muslims as Muslims. <coughs> they saw people as Egyptian, Syrian, Iranian, who didn't know, Pakistani, etc. So in my time, that was the case. There were virtually, virtually no Islamic centers or mosques. There were a few, but it's interesting to note that the two oldest mosques, as far as I can uh, recall, are in Iowa and in Quincy, Massachusetts. So we're not talking, and I was raised in cosmopolitan New York. They eventually had one mosque and it was in another part of New York City, and I never knew it existed, and to this day I've never seen it. Okay. All of that has changed remarkably, so that today in Europe and America, Islam is the second or third largest religion. In America, it's the third largest religion, and in future decades, uh, it will be the second largest. Islam is also the fastest growing of the world religions globally. So that's by way of an initial background. Now to talk a little bit about the context for getting to understand Islam and Muslims, and then, if you will, current events. On the one hand, I have the best job in the world, and I always say that, because for 40 years, for 40 years, I'm asked the same questions <laughs> by policymakers, by journalists, or I see them raised by the Trumps, the Carsons, the Michelle Bachmans, the Rick Santorums, the Newt Gingriches, and even well-meaning people. <laughs> Is Islam a particularly violent religion? Does Islam need reform? Is Islam particularly uh, misogynist? Um, what is it about Islam? Uh, do Muslims hate Jews and Christians? That is, not do Muslims, but do, do Muslims because of their religion, you know, hate Jews and Christians, etc. Okay. The only difference is I like to say that nobody asked me those questions when I first got into the profession because nobody was interested. When I finished my degree, most people said I would never get a job by majoring in Islam, and they were right. There were no jobs. I happened to be trained in four religions. I was in a monastery for 10 years, and then I was a business person very briefly, high school rather than grad school because I wanted to work with youth and then realized I'd rather strangle them than 
you have to be in the classroom with them. Um, you know you don't. You know you have a problem when you're sneaking out of a Catholic school and the principal's waiting at the base of the stairs, a nun, to catch the kids, and you're running down and you duck your hat and say, because you're shocked by her, "Good afternoon, sister," and you keep running. Okay. But in that time, going back to that time, religion itself in America was about Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. The new group were the Catholics. And there was a quite famous book at the time written by a sociologist of religion that basically was kind of looking and saying, oh, it's not just Protestants and Jews, it's Protestants, Catholics, and Jews today. That would have been like late 50s, 60s. In the, in the beginning of the 70s, you began to have people coming from, more people coming, particularly religious leaders from overseas, Buddhists from India, Buddhist monks, etc. But this was all kind of new wave. If you went to colleges and universities, if they were state universities, or if you will, secular universities or colleges, there were no religion departments. Where you had religion departments, they tended to be Christian, if it was a Christian college, and it would be Protestant, if it were Protestant, it would be Catholic, if it were Catholic, or it would be Jewish, if it were Jewish. It was only in the 70s that you begin to see departments of religion emerging in, if you will, secular of universities. Government had no interest in religion. The military. The media, I did a religion program. Yeah, they had religion programs at 6 a.m. in the morning they were broadcast because they were required to have community programming. So then they would do a religion program, but they would never put it on when anybody was likely to see it. They had to fill that slot. Our diplomats in our military who were going overseas serving in the region, there was no reason to look at it. Why? Because the notion of modernization and development the received wisdom of modernization and development was that modernization was a product of the West. Therefore, all countries that were not Western, in order to modernize, would, would have to become West, Westernized and secular. Western and secular. They have to follow that model. And so religion was seen as something that had to do with tradition. It was backwards. It was an obstacle to change, so why should you study it? As one prominent social scientist said in his book, Muslims had a choice between Mecca and Meccanization. Now, that gets blown apart in the last part of the 20th century, when you not only have the Iranian Revolution, but you then have a kind of global resurgence of religion that has taken place in all of the world's religions. And that resurgence has meant that for many folks, they either become more religious or they go back to their religion, hmm, privately or personally. For others, they believe that if their religion is important and is central to their life, and if they are going to follow God or fulfill the mandates of their religion, then the principles and values of their religion should also be reflected in their society. To push it to the right, more than 50% of Americans believe our laws should be based on the Bible. And more than 45% believe that religious leaders should be involved in that process. We're not even talking about what American Muslims think here. This is based on a Gallup world polls that were done uh, in the first decade of this uh, century. Okay, so that, that, that's the background to here. So against that background, and against the background in which the major professional organizations, American Political Science Association, American Historical, the American Academy of Religion did not have Islam represented there when I first joined, nor did it have Buddhism or Hinduism. It was basically established by, ultimately, they were professors of religion. Many of them were born as missionaries. They were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Some of my best friends are, at least three are. And when I first joined, I immediately got you know, the, uh, what do you call it, tweed jackets. Everybody had a tweed jacket with, uh, right, leather, you know. I learned to smoke a pipe. I got just the right bag, but here I was this ethnic Catholic, first person to go to college, let alone graduate school. So that's the way most of the, most of the guys dressed, and it was most of the guys. There were very, very few women. The Middle East Studies Association had almost no patterns that dealt with the role of religion in the Middle East. Phenomenal. When we had the Iranian Revolution, one of the top, specialist on Iran said throughout his PhD at Princeton, he never studied the role of Islam in contemporary Iraq. The only time he dealt with Islam was in the early century. 
Now, you notice this is a slow build-up to the lecture, so you may be wondering when will I, when will I finish. Ahmad and the dean have promised that they will serve breakfast, so you can take the shoes off and sit back. Plus, we already had the debate last night, what the heck, right? And it's only a few days till we see the real debate. religions and I talked on Islamophobia and at the end of it, this I mean this uh, woman who was probably like in her mid-twenties had children and she's, she's living in, and, and all of these people were coming from all over the United States and all over the world, she said, how do we deal with this growing anti-Muslim attitude? I worry about my children, what do we do about it? So I'm giving her an answer, you know, I'm trying to talk about what can you do, you know, you, you get involved in your community, people need to get to know Muslims, uh, uh, mosques, reach out to churches, and then I, I finish the talk, and you'll see I get bizarre at times. And I don't know why I said it, but I said, and then what we need to do for change, and I scream, vote for Bernie! <laughs> they all jumped up. It wasn't that they all agreed to it. I had gotten them so excited, they all jumped up, and probably 20% are going to vote for him. But that was okay. I'm not saying that I would vote for Bernie Sanders. I'm just saying Bernie Sanders. <laughs> but I remember my wife once saying in a party, she referred to the fact that I had voted for Barry Goldwater. And I don't remember voting for Barry. I come from a lifelong Democratic family. Uh, although I have not always voted Democrat, but Barry Goldwater, you know, and I remember saying, are you out of your mind? I never talked that way to my wife. I just said, are you out of your hell of a mind? No, are you out of your mind? And I suddenly realized I had done that. So we really don't know who I voted for. Okay. All right, now, so when did America encounter, encounter Islam? As I talk about Islam, just as when I talk about the global resurgence of religion, and I talked about religion, therefore people uh, bringing it more into their personal life or even wanting to see it in their society, also what happens is you begin to see militant forms of religion. Okay? We see militant Hinduism in the last decade or two that exists now, which therefore not only confronts Muslims but also Christians. We see militant Buddhists in Rohingya. You know, we see militant Christians, we see militant Jews, and we see militant Muslims. The reason I say that is because, remember, there are two sides or two faces of religion. There's a transcendent and a dark side. All religions believe in a transcendent reality. For the monotheistic religions, they call that transcendent reality God. But they believe in some kind of transcendent reality. Okay? And they believe that religion also helps its followers transcend themselves. That is, People of faith believe that religion not only answers the big questions, the meaning of life, who am I, why am I here, what should I be doing, but it gives me a path to follow to be a better person, to transcend my baser instincts, especially for non-Italians. For those of us who are saved, it doesn't matter. All right. But there's a dark side. All religions historically have a dark side. I send my students texts from the Quran, texts from the Old Testament, I could send them and say to them, without giving them a context, if you didn't know these religions, and I said this is in their sacred book, what would you think? Because there are passages of warfare, there are passages of significant warfare, and even genocide, for example, in, uh, in the Bible. Okay? So that part is there, those, those kinds of passages, unless you contextualize them. And we all, those of us who are believers all do. You know, whether we're Muslim, Christian, or Jew. It's not like we look at the passages in our sacred scripture and we don't contextualize it. Otherwise, what conclusions will we be drawing? The extremists do look at those passages and draw, if you will, uh, the wrong uh, conclusions. So, for Americans and for many in, in Europe who had never engaged with Muslims, never seen a Muslim, etc., you've got an Iranian revolution, hostage taking, and every day, News people going to the gate to get a report from Miriam, Mary, the spokesperson, on the condition of the hostages. Now, if you're an American and you've never met a Muslim and you put your TV on and every day you see people chanting death to America, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look and say, they don't like us, there's a problem. But the question is, who's the they? Why are they saying what they're saying? 
To show you what our context was, now I can walk. Can you hear me now? It's supposed to be. Oh, I didn't put it on. That's why you can't hear me. No, you can't do it. I got to put it on. All right, can you hear this now? Okay. All right, to show you how little we knew, the Today Show, Tom Brokaw, who was the main man on the Today Show at the time, stopped the program to say, let me tell you about Islam. It's the second largest of the world's religions. It has a book called the Quran and a prophet named Muhammad. That's how basic he felt he needed to put the information out. At least that. Now, imagine for educated Americans back then, let alone now, but even back then, if you went overseas as an educated American, would you ever believe that people in the world had never heard the word Bible or never heard the word Jesus? You know, I mean, you'd figure any educated person, and even not all that educated, would somehow be aware of that. So that's how narrow that context was. Okay. And when we don't know anything about people, we generalize from them. In my family, a mixed marriage, in my father's generation, was marrying a non-Italian. Not marrying a non-Catholic, marrying a non-Italian. My Aunt Kitty was Irish. My grandmother would often point to her because Aunt Kitty, like Uncle George, liked to drink. Aunt Kitty liked to drink beer. And my grandmother would point at the fact that Aunt Kitty sometimes drank too much beer and it would be like, that's the way all the Irish are. Okay? <coughs> Uncle George drank, but see, he was an Italian male. That's normal. Okay. Uh, the same thing happens with, with ethnic groups. If you've never met an Italian, you will think that that Italian is somebody who talks with his hands, who tends to be very emotive, because you never met my dad. You would have met my mother if you're meeting me. And we will generalize from that. Okay. So here they are looking at Iranians. And it's at that point, it's through the lens of the Iranian revolution that Islam then is seen globally. And they see Khomeini calling for the spread of the revolution to the Gulf and other places. And after the revolution, you had some uprisings in the Shia areas of Saudi Arabia, in Kuwait, in Bahrain. Uh, and there was great talk of the, you know, the, the global expansion. Now I can tell you it was never as much of a threat as most people thought, because I did a book on it. And the problem we had when we did the book is we discovered it had not spread the way we thought it did. Fortunately, my brother's a social scientist, an economist. My brother said to me, all you do is change your hypothesis. And then your data proves it. And, so was, and sure enough, the book sold. We got good reviews. But for a while, I was going to publish it, you know, in this, here's my thesis. And guess what? It didn't really work out. OK. So, but the reality of it is that's the way the world saw it. And later on, you'll hear me probably argue that the danger of George W. Bush administration and even the Obama administration and many of our politicians is not that they don't emphasize security, they do. But the danger is when you overemphasize fear, when you create a fear that's out of whack or disproportionate to the reality, neuroscience tells us when people have a high degree of fear, they're ready to accept authoritarian governance. They're ready to, to respond to demagogues. They're ready to look for somebody who's going to impose order at any cost. That's just my way of background. Okay, so we've got that lens of the hostages and fear of the export of the revolution. This comes again right after the Iranian revolution, which would be early 1980s. By 1990s, by the early 1990s, you had journalists and writers and talking heads, you know, me, uh, media people, some uh, political types, policy makers, in Europe and America, talking about Islam as a triple threat. Why? Because they saw what was going on in Iran and Lebanon, and so it's a, a political threat. Now remember, when it was a political threat, and even to our embassies, please do remember, when that was happening, it's in countries that had been colonized by Europe. It was in countries that were governed by, many of the time, authoritarian governments that were propped up financially and militarily by the US and Europe. That's not to justify, but it's not like this is just a, you know, that people are genetically born to somehow dislike certain Western countries, but somehow it's not gonna brush stroke the Japanese and Chinese because they don't have those genes inside. Okay, so that's, that's part of seeing. So it was it's a political threat, it's a civilizational threat, and a demographic threat, i.e. population. 
parenthetically, I'm from Brooklyn. I have a limited vocabulary. For the longest time, I didn't know what demographic meant. I mean, when it first came out, I'd you know, say to my wife, what does it mean? She'd say, you have a dictionary. I'd say, you were an English major, just tell me. Okay? Um, but a demographic meant. And so you had Pat Buchanan, some of you remember him, uh, a candidate. He wrote a piece called uh, uh, Rising Islam May Overwhelm the West. And he basically said, while they're humiliating us in the Middle East, as it were, in the West, Muslims are growing. And the example he gave was Germany. And he said, Turks working late into the night, Turkish doctors who have large families work late into the night on, if you will, native Germans who are very secular, um, you know, are very secular in their approach to religion, performing abortions. So we've got this population that's not having a lot of children. It's also aborting a lot of the, their children. And here you have to, he wasn't saying that the Turks were bad. It's just that you've got this, you know, this new group, and it's proliferating. Does that sound a little familiar to America in the last few years? I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so you had that political, civilizational. And so people would say, well, if you look at past history, there was always a confrontation between Islam and Christianity. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't. First of all, Islam proved to be, presented itself as an alternative religion to Judaism and Christianity. And so for Christianity, it's thought that it was the one final religion. Therefore, Islam was a theological threat because it was also spreading and people were converting, including lots of Eastern Christians were converting to it. Um, but it also was a theological threat, but also a political threat because alongside Christendom as an empire, you now had the expansion of an Islamic empire. But when people use phrases like there are 14 centuries of jihad, that's like what some Muslims say there are 14 centuries of crusades. In other words, you have folks on both sides of the religious divide who were engaging at different times in religiously legitimated wars. Those wars were often not primarily religious, but legitimated in the name of the religion. Crusades is a perfect example. It was a political venture that needed to be legitimated, so there was an appeal to the Pope, and Pope Urban said, God wills it. Okay. Okay. Um, now, if we wind up looking at the situation today, we see that the rise of Al-Qaeda, the rise of ISIL, gives us a background and a basis for where things are going. So that today, as major polls confirm, and domestic and international politics reflect, the acts of Muslim violent extremists and terrorists often brushstroke the vast majority of Muslims who project the collective guilt and threaten their civil liberties and distort the understanding of a faith. That's not to say that a faith isn't used for violence and terrorism, but it distorts, if you will, the mainstream faith. An example would be, if you have, uh, if you have uh, uh, Jewish fundamentalists in Israel that attack and kill Palestinians or a Palestinian child, and they are seen as being Jewish fundamentalists, in other words, not just sort of, you know, uh, uh, secular actors, we don't turn around and say, uh, say Judaism and all Jews are brushstroke by that. We say, there go some Jewish radicals, or very often they're referred to as nationalists, ultra-nationalists. Uh, if you have Christians, who engage in violence and terror in the Central African Republic, who blow up abortion clinics and say that you know, God wills it and somehow cite their scriptures. For those of us who are Christian, we don't say, oh, well, that's what our tradition's about. We say that's a distorted nation. And yet, I would say, if you look at the presidential elections in 2008, 2012, congressional elections in 2010, and if you look at the uh, recent uh, primary conversations, and if you look at a good deal of media, um, uh, you will see were, uh, accusations made about Islam and mainstream Muslims okay, that you would never say about another religion. You would never say about uh, Judaism. You would never say about another ethnic group. You would not say it about mainstream ethnic groups, Italians, Irish. You wouldn't say it about Jews, etc. Okay. So this is just by way of background in terms of what's out there. All you have to do is substitute the word. I've actually done that. You know, I get up and I wind up using another word, and somebody says, you can't talk about African Americans that way. You can't talk about Catholics that way, or Christians that way. You know, that's not the whole faith. That's just what, you know, some people did. So, and I'll get to why that happens and how it happens. 
But let me very briefly say, uh, address the question of then of Jews, I'm sorry, Jews, Muslims and their relationship to Jews and Christians or the faith itself. Islam doesn't see itself, and Muslims don't see itself as a new religion. Everybody thinks Islam is a new religion. Because the people who think that, of course, are people of other religions. So since they're the old religion, it's a new religion. Um, they see themselves as children of Abraham. They see themselves as having a revelation that first came to Moses, the Torah, then came to Jesus, the Gospels, and then came to Muhammad. The belief is that the Torah and the Gospels were distorted at some point. For example, that the Gospels were influenced by a good deal of Greek thought so that Jesus, the great prophet, becomes somehow the son of God, just as you know you have Greek gods, etc. Um, and so, therefore, you have your major prophets, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, but Muslims accept all of the biblical prophets. And they accept them so much that a devout Muslim Whenever a devout Muslim, uh, or at least a conservative Muslim, and not even that conservative Muslim, when he says Muhammad's name, he will say, peace and blessings be upon him. They say the same thing when they say the name of Jesus or Moses. They name their children, Isa, Jesus, Musa, Moses. I have a Muslim friend who's a Muslim leader, a major national leader. He's got a, two sons named Jesus and Moses. And as he said to me one time, when you had things like the cartoons, Danish cartoons and others, you have all of these, you know, statements made about Muhammad. He said, you know, it's frustrating to me. He said, you don't realize it. He said, everybody can say that about our prophet, but we can't say that and back and say, oh, you want to talk about Muhammad? Well, let me tell you about Moses and Jesus. Because yeah. they're our prophets. So we can't say anything. What does that really mean? It means that, for example, the Virgin Mary there's more about the Virgin Mary, she's mentioned more in the Quran than she is in the New Testament. That Jesus is, has a significant role to play in the New Testament. Again, as a great prophet, but not as a God. And how about Jews and Christians? Jews and Christians are seen as people of the book. That is, people who have a scripture. And that notion late, in later centuries was extended to other religions. And so you have phrases in the Quran that talk about the fact that Jews, Muslims, and Christians should vie with each other in terms of following God's will. Are there some passages where Jews and Christians are criticized? Yes, reflecting the context. And so you have a, a passages, for example, where there was a belief that some Jewish tribes had, had actually a, a, a sided with the Meccans or the opposition uh, to, to the Muslims, and so you have harsh passages. But most of the passion, passages talk both uh, about the religious <coughs> leaders of these faiths and their people uh, in, uh, in, a, uh, in a positive context. How about the, the, the notion of God in Islam? I love when people say, well, the God of Islam is simply vengeful. Hey, read the Old Testament. Uh, I mean, you know, God is both compassionate, but God also in some passages says, you didn't listen to me, go kill all the women, children, animals, etc. You can see that in a number of books. This is a, with the internet, you can just look it up. I'm not just, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, making this up. But how do Muslims see God, and how do they experience God in their life? If you are a pious Muslim who reads the Quran, every chapter of the Quran begins with this, in the name of God, the merciful and compassionate. If you are a, a, you know, a devout Muslim, you will begin your day by saying this, you will say it before a meal. You will say it before you give a speech. You will say it before an undertaking. You will say it when you're going to drive a car. Some of my Muslim friends need to say that. <laughs> Although I drove with my brother, who's not a Muslim, and need to say that. Everybody put their seatbelt on. Uh, uh, a pious Muslim, when they uh, write a letter, maybe, or a book, will have that at the top. Raised as Catholic, we used to put a cross and have Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. So, I mean, we had a kind of similar kind of thing, you know? And then it was beat the Lutherans of ethics. No, no, no. I was raised in a different time. To join the Boy Scouts, the big issue was that the Boy Scouts, though led by an Italian Catholic, met in a Methodist church in the basement. Not in the church, in the basement. And that was an issue. Because you couldn't go in the church for a wedding unless you got permission. Now you're in the basement. But if you're in the basement and it's a Methodist church, it means they're going to be Methodist in the Boy Scouts. So now, would you be a minority among many Lutherans? And what could that lead to? My mind. 
Um, my wife and I are godparents for a Lutheran priest uh, grandchild uh, today. In those days, in the old days, people would have been shocked. Okay. God is seen as the creator, provider, and judge. Muslims believe in heaven, as it were, heaven, hell, death, and judgment, although not necessarily an eternal hell. But there is a belief in God, God's prophets, God's angels. There is a belief in the fact that there is moral accountability and responsibility in life much shared in the, with the Judeo-Christian tradition. That's not to say that there aren't differences among the faiths. Just as we talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition, and there are incredible differences between Judaism and Christianity, as well as that which we share in common. And historically, that's true. Most of you know, can anybody tell me how old the phrase Judeo-Christian is? When did it come into modern parlance? That's right. It's a 20th century phenomenon. Obviously, it is. It did exist historically. The last thing Christians thought was that there was a Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, in terms of persecution throughout the years, let's say. Okay. So that's a, a, a fairly modern realization of what exists. The same thing is true if you talk about a Judeo-Christian now Islamic tradition. Because Islam does not come out of Hinduism and Buddhism. Islam moves out of the tradition of Judaism and, uh, and Christianity. But moving right along, I will now go to the Quran on diversity in people in the book, and then I will move to Islamophobia, world affairs, and if we have 10 minutes, I will do some chemistry and biology with you, since I have an ego that doesn't quit. Okay, the Quran affirms God's decision to create not just a single nation or tribe, so not just one group, but a world of different nations, ethnicities, tribes, languages, and religions. O oh, humankind, we have created you male and female and made you nations and tribes so that you might come to know one another. The Quran's recognition of the human community's religious diversity and support for religious pluralism comes in texts like to every one we have appointed a way and a course to follow. Or, for each there is a direction toward which he turns to pray, to Jerusalem, to Mecca, etc., Vie, therefore, with one another in the performance of good works. Wherever you may be, God shall bring you all together on the day of judgment. Surely God has power over all things. And then finally, there is no compulsion of religion. There is to be no compulsion in religion. Now, are there Muslims today who don't follow it? Yes. Are there Muslims in the past who don't follow it? Yes. Were there Christians historically that didn't follow Christianity and that in fact persecuted anybody who wasn't Christian, or to put it another way, Catholics, anybody who wasn't Catholic, Catholics who persecuted Protestants, would persecute Jews, you know, would, would persecute Muslims at times, yes, were there Protestants who did the same thing? If you read Luther and what he thought of Muslims, let alone Catholics, interesting. Great man, very spiritual man, but a man of his time, as it were, in terms of the times then. Okay. But who are American Muslims? What do they believe? What do they do? Today, I think Mr. Trump, Mr. Carson, Mr. Santorum, Mr. Cruz, and all the other misters, I'm not, this, I'm not privileging anybody here, you need to keep this in mind. American Muslims today, like other ethnic groups that came here and other religious groups, it takes decades to become integrated. They are economically, socially, educationally, and increasingly politically integrated. What does that mean? Here's hard data from Gallup and Pew. They do major studies on this. Okay. Educationally, for Muslims, education is a priority. They are second to American Jews in terms of religious communities and their level of education and commitment to education, second. How does it, what does that mean? 40% of Muslims have college degrees versus 29% of Americans overall. Muslim women are as educated and as employed as Muslim men, something that does not exist in many Muslim countries and something that does not exist in America in certain religious communities. Where the man will be more educated, the wife will have the MA, and the man may be the physician or the PhD. We're moving out of that, but for a long time that was the case. Socioeconomically, they span the spectrum. They are professionals. They are, if you, if you know Muslims, they are in this order. Physician, 
lawyer, engineer. After that, there's no existence. <laughs> After that, oh God, what happened? What happened to my son? Is he really my son? Is that really my daughter? I'm exaggerating a bit. But you know, it's the doctor, then the lawyer. I've had so many occasions. I give talks to Muslim organizations. I'll say, how many doctors are there? Kidding. You get sick of a Muslim fundraiser, you're fine. 20% of physicians. <laughs> then you see husband and wife. Husband, wife, and children. Three and four. I went with one guy recently. He said, there's my kid who's a doctor. And my, law, my daughter, she was going to go to medical school. She went to law school. She's a good girl. She's, okay, she's doing well. All right. But they belong to other professions. They are entrepreneurs. 40% are, are small business entrepreneurs. They're Silicon Valley uh, people and successful Silicon Valley people. They uh, are blue collar workers. They are taxi drivers. They are uh, cab drivers. I had one Muslim driver who was Pakistani. He said, you know, I work here. My wife's back in Pakistan. I go home for four months. I send her money. She can have, you know, a servant, a good life. You know, we're not wealthy, but there it's easy to get. She wants to come here all the time. I keep telling her, you're not going to have the same life. She comes here. We have a small apartment. I wake up. She's driving me crazy. He said, you know, they say Muslim men don't like their women to work. Every morning I say to her, get a job. Get a job. Go to the library. But Today, if you look at the American Muslim profile, we're talking about people who go to college, people who go to graduate school, graduate from some of the best schools that we have. They are firemen, they are first responders, they were killed in the Twin Towers. I attended and spoke at a funeral for a young husband and wife, both of whom worked in the Twin Towers. So we see them across the spectrum. 70% have a job compared with 64% of Americans overall. Among non-working folks, 31% are full-time students compared to 10% of the general American public, 31 to 10%. 77% of Muslims say they worship the same God as Christians and Jews. 84% said Muslims should strongly emphasize their shared values. And then there's the acid test of pluralism. The acid test of pluralism is a phrase from a Muslim scholar friend of mine who said the acid test of pluralism is whether or not people believe that although their religion is the fullness of truth for them, other people can be following a faith that will also lead to heaven. And of course we have the ultra-conservative Christians and Muslims who don't believe that. But 56% 56, 56 of Muslims say many religions can lead to eternal life. 33% say my religion is the one true faith leading to eternal life. The percentage among uh, ultra-conservative Protestants is a little bit greater than, uh, than, than that percentage. Okay, then why, as I would argue, and how has fear of Islam become normalized in popular culture? Why has that happened? Well, to begin with, as I said a little bit earlier, domestic and international terrorist attacks by AQ and ISIL, but also American elections and the play of an American elections in playing on the notion of fear and security, the excessive play on that brushstrokes the majority of those citizens as it did World War II, brushstroke Japanese and also Germans and Italians, among others. You know, because the populations here were somehow then seen as connected to, quote, unquote, uh, the enemy. What we've had then is an exponential growth, as the uh, Public Religion Research Institute says, no religious, social, racial, or ethnic group was perceived as facing greater discrimination in the US than Muslims. And the major, two major studies of the media that show that we're at an all-time high in terms of negative coverage. Now please follow this uh, briefly. I'm gonna go an extra 10 minutes. We started a little late. We're dealing with the Middle East. Uh, sit back, relax, mellow. Breathe deeply. Okay, you'll have a God experience, trust me. Um, okay. Let me give you a thing on media. There's a group called Media Tenor. For those of you that are students, and I know some of the undergraduates have a problem with this, M-E-D-I-A is media. And tenor is T-E-N-O-R. And then you go on the internet and you look it up, okay? This is an app that based in Switzerland. They monitor, they have one, there's 100 or 200 people, I forget, 
who every day monitor major European and American media. So they, they log all the stories that are out there. They did a study of the coverage of Islam and Muslims from 2001 to 2011. And then I'll give you an update. 2001 to 2011. When they looked at media, European and American media, and all the different topics they covered, they found that 2% of the media covered extremism, Muslims, and 0.1% covered the vast majority of Muslims and the Muslim world, etc. Okay? In other words, normal Muslims, normal life. So 2% extremism, 0.1% is the other side. 2011, the 2% goes up to 25%. And some of us would say, well, there are attacks and stuff, and then people overreact, so okay, 25%. The other side remains at 0.1%. Now think about what that disparity is. You know, it's one thing when you talk about 2% versus 0.1, but 25 versus the other. You get that incredible. And remember, you can't totally blame media even though I will criticize media, because it's the media owners, but they're like bankers and everybody else. It's the bottom line. And like universities, it's the bottom line. So if it bleeds, it leads. It's, it's the race to get an audience, to sell a newspaper. What sells is conflict and conflict discourse. Whatever side of the spectrum you're on. For example, watch Fox and watch MSNBC. I have a good friend, a really good friend, who we don't discuss politics. He has a great line on this. John, he listens to everything from Fox. John, you'd be surprised at how often I disagree with Rush Limbaugh. I said, that makes me feel really good. <laughs> the only way you can make that statement data-wise is that you listen to him a heck of a lot. You know? uh, and how about Sean and Ed? OK, all right. Um, and I have done the O'Reilly Show. It's great for selling your books. It spikes books more than any program I've ever done. But what the heck? For money, what, what will we do? No, I, I did that because my publisher wanted me to do it. OK, now let me give you the latest statistics. Things are at the worst today. What does that mean? A recent study by Media Tenor found that 80% of media is negative on Islam and Muslim. Not just on Muslim terror, on Islam. 80% is negative. What does that mean? If you look at the US, the UK, and Germany, US, UK, and Germany, nine out of 10 stories on Islam and Muslim is negative. Nine out of 10. Okay. Um, when they look at the mainstream, more than 50% are negative. It's kind of like, I'm making this up, my analogy is always bad. It's kind of like saying, we're going to look at the mainstream Catholic experience, and then we focus on pedophilia. Now, pedophilia should be brought out. But if you're talking about the mainstream community, it's different. When they go to look at individual figures, only 5% look at another word. Do you know how we feature certain people? Pope Francis, or whenever we're talking about a faith, the Dalai Lama. No. So that 5% is warlords and jihadists. Okay. So it's against that media background. Now, the other component is social media. I would argue, and it's not just me, other people would say this, mass media used to be the driver. And then people would be influenced by mass media, and then they'd get on the internet, and then it would impact social media. The last 10 years, it's the opposite. Social media is the main vehicle and arbiter for popular culture. You know, most people don't read newspapers every day. Most people get their information off the internet. Okay? Now, what does that mean? It means that we've had an exponential growth in anti-Islam and anti-Muslim websites. You know, websites like Jihad Watch, etc. you know, answering Islam, but it also means there are a lot of websites that are not primarily concerned with Islam and Muslims, but they are anti-immigrant in their politics. They are very neocon, anti-immigrant, uh, and anti-Muslim. So they're websites that don't just focus every day, but they pull those stories over. It's what we call a cottage industry. In other words, they take stories that are generated someplace else and then publish them over here. You know, I've seen that happen. Um, I had an attack done on me once where it appeared in one publication, and I thought, oh, that's what's doing it. No, it was the writer of another publication who had done it. This publication picks up the story, and it gets better, because what others do is they pick up the bulk of the story to change the title. Therefore, if you go to Google me on that day, you've got all of these, you know, instead of seeing one story, you see like four, five, six, and if they don't want to be accused of absolute plagiarism, Two-thirds of it comes from the original, and then they add something else that's out there about you. So it says, now, 
How serious is this phenomenon? What makes a phenomenon serious is the amount of money that gets pumped into it and the amount of, of folks who do it and how robust that venture is. Let me give you two studies based on IRS returns. So these aren't claims, IRS returns. So for example, we did one on, on, on one, one fellow uh, who, pu who, who publishes something. You go, you look at his IRS report, uh, returns and what do you discover? He's got this, and his is very much, it's, it's, he publishes something called Front Page. He also supports Jihad Watch, etc. Uh, and this was a couple of years ago, about two or three years ago, the figures on it. He had a budget of, uh, I think it was $7 million and a personal salary close to $600,000. So that means there's money coming in. Now let me give you an idea of the money coming in. The Center for American Progress did a study of 10 years and just looked at seven, just looked at seven mainstream uh, uh, philanthropies, conservative philanthropies, but mainstream philanthropies. It doesn't mean that these philanthropies knew where their money was going. They may or may not. In other words, if you've got a big philanthropy, they give money to lots of people, and they may give it to an individual, but not realize that that individual may use it. But anyway, from that, okay, $42.5 million over a 10-year period. That's peanuts. Another group, CARE, looking at IRS returns, did a three-year study and found $119.5 million. And that's, this is not a global study of all the money that's out there. But you're talking now, what I just threw out to you, is probably up in the $160, $170 million. There are no comparable websites. There are a couple of websites out there. We have a new website, which I would recommend to you. It's called bridge.georgetown.edu. You just go to bridge.georgetown.edu. It's called the Bridge Protecting Pluralism. And if we protect American pluralism, then we want to work to end Islamophobia. But if you go there, you will get all kinds of data you want on funding, on, on stories about who are Muslims, what are the attacks on, uh, when the candidates say stuff like Carson and Trump, we have stories that say, this is what they say, let's look at the hard data. And then we provide hard data, et cetera. Bridge.georgetown.edu. But most, there, there are no comparable other side. So that's the context in which that occurs. You have that explosion. What's the net effect? Well, the net effect is when you look at American political elections, look at the kinds of things that are raised. You know, why is it that when President Obama was running the first time and he was in Detroit, there were young women, there were young people who were going to take a picture. Some of his people wanted to move the women with hijab, the two young women, out of the picture. Why is it the president uh, did not visit a mosque until, what, two months ago in America, yet he had gone to mosques overseas? Can you imagine his not having visited a synagogue? Can you imagine not having visited at least a Protestant church or a Catholic church? I mean, this is the whole, because he knew it was a political you know, issue. Not only for himself, but for his party. Okay? Now, what does it mean in terms of, as a result, the way in which Americans, many Americans, view Islam and Muslims? Ask what they know about Islam and Muslims. 55% say nothing or I don't know. More than 50% say that they don't know a Muslim, which is pretty amazing at this stage of the game. Uh, and more than 50% have been saying consistently, I really want to learn more about Islam. Um, we all have those great, you know, good attentions. We know what Mr. Trump has said, you know, that temporary freeze on all foreign Muslim immigration, monitoring <coughs> or even forced closure of American mosques, um, the other stuff that he said, which I won't go into, Mr. Carson saying that for a Muslim to be president, they had to give up the main tenets of their, their faith, um, and Rick Santorum, etc., on and on and on. Uh, a majority do not know a Muslim. 33% believe that Muslim Americans are more sympathetic to terrorists, and 60% of those polled have negative feelings about Muslims. I'll come back to that statistic and give you an, a, a, an opposite statistic based on our data. Less than half believe U.S. Muslims are loyal to the United States. We have, of course, Muslims in Congress, etc. Today, only 27% of Americans have a favorable opinion, down from 35% in 2010. So, where do we go from here? Here's my wrap up. It's not enough to say we're just going to make things better by being better people. 
we have to figure out in our society the way we introduce all kinds of change. How do we change attitudes about racism? How do we change attitudes about anti-Semitism? How do we change attitudes about new ethnic groups that are getting their roots, whether they're Italians or anybody else? It's engaging with people. It's being educated. But I emphasize change from below, engagement. Engagement. My wife and I are both working class, lower middle class in background, pretty low middle class in background, first generation to go to college. And so we finally moved to a nice suburb of Massachusetts, and I go to dinner with neighbors, and there's a new guy in the neighborhood who buys the best house, drives a big Continental and is very well dressed, and he's Italian. So we go to dinner, and they spend the time talking about the fact that <laughs> Turns out I ran with him a few times. Not a rather glitzy outfit that he wore, but he could have been an entertainer. But they went on and on about, you know, mafia, you know. And I said to my wife after, now this was about 30 years ago, so things have changed considerably. I said, don't they realize I'm Italian? Even my neighbors. She said, not for them. You're not Italian. You have a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. In my time, the idea, when I first got my job at Holy Cross, this guy would ask, this Jesuit would ask me, one year, three years later, so how are you, how's your wife, how are your children? I said, I told you, you don't have children, you're not going to have them. How's your garden? I'm raised in Brooklyn. The tree grows in Brooklyn, that's not it. <laughs> I said, my car. She said, you know, zucchini. I said, no, I, don't, I don't. I said, but I did build a patio. He smiled. I said, gotcha. Because you know, we Italians deal in cement. We deal in construction, and we put people in cement. <laughs> <laughs> You're young, too young to realize Jimmy Hoffa, the famous guy that disappeared. Okay? But those kinds of, I talk about my cousin Guido, and people laugh, but they believe it. I mean, I'm in political situations, and I'll say things like, we're trying to say, how can we get people to do something? I say, well, I'll get my cousin Guido to do it. And I don't think I'm really going to get my cousin Guido, but they believe I have a cousin Guido. And that my cousin Guido will break legs, or could break legs, but I have that kind of connection. That's changed in the last 20, 30 years. Italian Americans are now corporate. Italian Americans uh, uh, have, we had Italian American who led the, who was the president of the American League. I mean, they were, they were all over the place. But we were seen for decades and brushstroke you just seen as mafia, or we're good with our hands, but you never expect us to go to a major university, maybe go to a Catholic university, but you're not going to go to Harvard or, or Yale. I mean, you know, you're just not going to get in. That's why Scalia was the exception. <laughs> in more ways than one. Okay. So what about the future? The future is as follows. Number one, and I'm not saying this because you have the setting here of, of Arabic and Islamic studies. Um, uh, and you're, you, know, you're, you have an opportunity to build it. It's phenomenal what you could do here because you have a center and you have so many students who are already studying Middle Eastern languages, for example. And you've got a religion department, etc. So you've got something in place. It's only when people get to know the other, both as people, as persons, as well as the religion and culture. Otherwise, if you're relying on media or the internet, how do you know when you get on the internet what's true or not? Do you ever look at American thinker? I did. I thought it would have an intellectual flavor to it. Family security, these are some of the worst. Pajama media sounds really pretty innocuous. You know, so the, the issue is how do we educate the next generation? Well, we're well along that way. Unlike the time when, when I came out, we weren't teaching about other cultures and religions. The idea of being pluralistic was to have something on Russia, of course, in the Soviet Union, and maybe something on China. And of course, languages were modern languages. You know, we had a wonderful modern language department. When we went to teach Chinese and Japanese, the language department said, we can't touch them, they're not modern. <laughs> Almost like the people are modern too. You know? we, can't, we can't get into that. So that educational side. It's important for religious leaders. But it's not just, that line is, uh, and pardon my language, but you could just say he's first generation ethnic from Brooklyn. That line is bullshit. You know, major religious leaders can sign documents, and I've been part of some of the major documents, a common word between us and you, etc. I'm not a religious leader, but I get invited as an expert, etc. Okay? 
But those documents get archived. The question is, do you train, train the next generation of ministers, rabbis, madams to be pluralistic, to know about other faiths, to cooperate? That is, that is moving, but nowhere near enough. And how about people in an audience like this? People will say, well, you know, you can deal with these issues because you're an academic. Religious leaders can do this, political leaders. There's so much that can be done. You can have community discussion groups, and that's just not a vague thing. I did a talk where I've come out, and several people will say to me, you know, we just met a few people who are going to have a, a discussion group on religion. You can get your church, your synagogue, your, your civic organization to run programs where one attempts to understand the culture and the religion of other people. We, we, you know, we, we've done that in our history. There's no reason why. Unless we do, then we're, we're dealing with stereotypes. When my wife first met me, I didn't know she had never, been, you know, never met an Italian other than her neighbor. So she comes to meet my mother. My wife was and is a beautiful blonde. I married her, I'm serious, for her brains. And I noticed them as she walked away from me once. But in any case, blonde, blue eyes, very bright, etc. Okay? I bring her to see my mother, and she wears a black dress. Italians wore black in those days for months in the morning. Okay? Very little makeup, her blonde hair pulled back in a kind of bun. She meets my parents, and everything went really well. And after her, I said, what was the problem? She said, what do you mean? Was the I said, you look really nervous. She said, I well, was. She said, you know. The only Italians I know are my next door neighbors. You know, they're loud. I mean, they're nice people, but they're loud, they're crude, they fight a lot. Irish, I mean, they're Irish. My people aren't like that. We do opera. We do opera. We don't do other people. Mafia is somebody else. Okay, so the same thing here. It's, it, it's, the, it's engaging. And particularly, the most important, I say for, say for last, the way that you get to respect somebody is when you get to know them. So. If you're involved in schools with regard to children of different, if you've got people of different religions and ethnic groups, if you're involved in sports together, uh, if you're involved in where there are issues where there are drugs, or if you're involved in environmental movements, if you're involved in all kinds of NGO activities, if you have diverse people coming together, and you're not discussing religion. See, the whole idea is you don't get together and say, ooh, I'm explaining Trinity. That's a great way to go nowhere, you know? You know? Why do you believe that Muhammad was a prophet? You know? I mean, Muhammad, I mean, he was a prophet, but he was also a warrior. How can you do both? Oh, how about David? How about Joshua? I would, oh, I would. The idea is that you're working with other people. Then somebody comes along and says, you know, those Italians are like this. Those Jews are like that. Those Muslims are like that. Those Arabs are like that. Your instinct will be to say, to yourself, well, they can't all be like that because I know this person and I know some others and I've gone out to lunch with them or I've gone out to... It's that bottom up. The top down doesn't work as well. I mean, it's nice to have speeches by a president. It's nice to have, but it's got to be internalized. You know, it's got to be internalized. And unless it's there, we just don't make it. So I strongly encourage those of you that are older to think about ways in which you can learn more about other people and cultures, and those of you that are younger to take advantage of the university. And why? And this is my last point. When I began, and nobody cared about what I did. I didn't get invited. Okay? And if I did talk, the audiences were small. And if I made a point like, this is important, and even said stuff like that we really believe in theoretically, like this is America, we're a country that's, you know, of all kinds of people, people would, you know, they want to yawn and think about, post 9-11, what do we know? It can affect us. If we don't understand other cultures, whether it's the Muslim world, it's China, you know, it's, it's Russia, and if you don't take an interest in our politics, it's not like the old days when you could just decide to vote straight ticket. Or I think I won't vote, but things will be okay. It is important who our people in Congress are. It is important who, because we know they can take us to war. And we know now that it's not conventional war. I would argue in the old days it was a little easier because conventional wars were always fought over there. The reason why we're so afraid now is because we feel, oh my gosh, we don't put it this way, something new. We don't just go over there and fight, get killed and kill people, but it can happen here. So we know that. We know the economic repercussions of it. Think about how those attacks on the Pentagon and Washington affected our economy and for how many years. That's exactly what the terrorists wanted to do. 
and how they affected our fear factor. Totally disproportionate to the numbers. I saw at any given time it's at 25 or 30,000. It doesn't mean that they're not dangerous. But that's 25 or 30,000 people. How many people have actually been killed by Muslim extremists in America? Over a 13 year period, something like 50. How many attacks have been done <coughs> yearly by white anti-government and also Christian identity type groups? 337. What did the FBI identify this year as the major terrorist threat in America? What group? Anybody tell me? White anti-government neo-Nazi, those kinds of groups. Okay. The Southern Poverty Law Center that they quote started reporting this three years ago. If you go up to the Southern Poverty Law Center, they put out a new report. The percentages jump out at you. So our challenge is to see things in perspective. Our challenge is to know, the, to know something about the world we live in because we're going to be voting for people. You know? And I think it's important for Americans to know whether or not all Mexicans are drug dealers, etc., and there may be a few of them, I'm told, who are okay. I mean, there are incredible repercussions for that. You know, but for those of us who aren't Mexican, there are. It's important in terms of how Muslims are seen when you look at the civil liberties issues. You know, major civil liberties issues. I mean, they're, they're, the thousands of people who have been arrested, and then you look at the numbers that have actually been convicted of anything, totally out of whack, totally disproportionate. And that's a danger because there are people who fall through the cracks and wind up being sentenced to prison for 40, 50, 60 years, you know? And I always say to people, it could be the next group. You know, we always think it's not going to be us because we're the established group. After 9-11, after I see the sign on the front page of the New York Times, a gas station, and a guy saying, send them all back. And there's his Italian name on them. And I'm thinking, you're probably second generation and you think you came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you want your daughter to be a daughter of the American Revolution. In other words, the ethnic group that gets in by about the second and third, then it's like, oh, we're American, and now we've got these new immigrants. We don't need new immigrants. Okay, that's it. <laughs>
what we have to do is, is wherever we want to bring change in the world, we need to have, we need to partner with people to do it. We can't act as if we're going to change people because that becomes a form of colonialism. You know, I mean, you know, be like somebody do whatever anybody wants to do that to us, we get really upset. You know, uh, some of you are too young to remember, but a number of years ago, after the Cold War, it became what's going to be the next, you know, global power. You know, would it be, uh, you know, Europe, Germany, but also Japan? And there were people who were saying, Japanese companies are so successful, their work ethic, then we really need to imitate their models. If you're going to do that, then you've got to know something about the language and culture. And a lot of people really got kind of upset because they felt it was going to be forced on them. I think that, I would say this, I think the U.S. has to take a much more robust policy uh, towards uh, some of the authoritarian regimes in the community. The failure of the Arab Spring in some countries was not just due to domestic politics, it was due to some of the Gulf states that were playing an incredibly strong role uh, in attempting democratization to develop. And the same thing is true. In some Muslim societies and countries overseas, you have um, a more uh, pluralistic approach, and in others you don't. Uh, and in, in Saudi Arabia, you've had a very closed society, and so there are issues. There are reforms taking place in Saudi Arabia, but the real, the real question is who ultimately winds up formulating policy and what policies do they develop? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on the answer, but you can take, why don't you take two more, and then I'll answer them together. Hello, Professor. Uh, do, do the 9-11, do you think it's go, gonna take decades for morality to take effect because of 9-11? That, I'm sorry. In other words, you, yeah. you do the 9-11, what happened in 9-11? Yeah. It may take decades before we get the kind of plurality that... Yeah. I, well, I think there are a couple of things. I think that uh, when we created my center, which would have been in 1993, um, and it was just before we were celebrating our, our board, uh, right after they beat 9-11 our 10 year. And, and I remember that the, the co-chair said, you know, the center that you created has achieved exponentially more than we could have ever thought. Really move forward. But with 9-11, we we'll set back several decades. Well, I thought maybe one. It's going to be several. I think it'll take at least another decade to work our way through. But it's not totally 9-11. The fact is, after 9-11, things were not all that bad. There were problems. It started about two or three years after 9-11. And, and then it went, it, it moved up. And you began to have the, the attacks also, not only in Europe, but subsequent attacks where we then invaded Iraq. Uh, and then you had the, you know, the Taliban, uh, et cetera. And look at what Iran, what it's meant with Iran. It's been decades with Iran. So memories, you know, on both sides are a problem. But I, I think, um, but for me, the big thing is realizing that just as it took us centuries to deal with racism with regard to black people, and we're still dealing with anti-Semitism, but to deal with it, if we allow this anti-Muslim thing, you know, to really get out of, out of hand, uh, we're going backwards rather than forwards. Give it again. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for your uh, enlightening right here. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much for your uh, enlightening presentation. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I totally agree with you that engaging one another, Muslims and people from other faiths, is, is the best option we have, engaging in interfaith dialogue and interfaith work. Uh, however, um, Right after the attacks in Paris in San Bernardino, um, a strange phenomenon that I had heard about, uh, which is Muslims reporting that their neighbors, their co-workers, and even Muslim physicians from their own patients who have been working with them for a while, uh, questioning their integrity. Questioning their integrity. I mean, a neighbor, a non-Muslim neighbor, going to his Muslim neighbor telling him, what do you think about what happened in San Bernardino? Do you, do you agree with that? And uh, a, a person working in the same office with somebody else for decades asking the same question. So uh, how do you explain this? Well, you know, I mean, again, until you get really integrated, you know, um, but I can tell you, I, I remember, uh, it was, I think, um, might have been at the time of the Algerian War, I forget, and there was a lot of violence. 
Uh, a friend of mine had just done his PhD in Tunisia from MIT, lived in the neighborhood, went to a local store, really got along with the owners, and there was some sort of terrorist attack in North Africa or wherever that they moved. And he was stunned when the owners said to him, are you a Muslim fundamentalist? Because they're looking at the media and they use phrases like that, you know, and use them, you know, indiscriminately. Uh, and no, there's tremendous problems. Uh, the British government has put in something called prevent. The big thing now is 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 uh, CDE, combating violent extremists. In all countries, that's their priority. Everything else in the background. Number one, that's a total exaggeration. Okay, a lot of bad stuffs happening in the Middle East, but. It's done by a relatively small group. They are causing a lot of chaos over there, but it's not like it's going to take over the globe. It's not like they're all going to arrive here. There may be an attack here, you know, by an individual, but we see more attacks in the last two years occurring by white Americans going into high schools, going into post offices, you know, going into wherever and committing their crimes. So we've got to kind of, it seems to me, uh, you know, put that uh, in, in perspective. But the PREVENT Act actually, some of the PREVENT Act actually has teachers trained to monitor kids in nursery school. Not if they see something, I don't know what you see with a kid in nursery school, <laughs> but you know what I mean? But to, and, and therefore to do things like, oh, Miriam, your uncle's visiting you from Egypt? What? You know, I can't imagine what she would say or he would say, but you know, like, Tell me about your life, you know, or, you know, mm. what does the family talk about? Or you have, also in France, the idea that what are the embassies to look for if you have a kid in your class and you see him reading a religious book, or he's reading the Quran, you know, or, you know, he's growing a beard. That's like saying today, if you see somebody with a cross around their neck, or they're wearing a yarmulke, or they have a turban. And we know, we, we, in a way, we're getting to that. Look at the number of Sikhs that have been killed because people think Sikh solutions. But I mean, that kind of, you know, uh, level of, of, uh, of monitoring. And what's left out, this isn't part of my talk, what I want to say is the heart of combating extremism is not just getting religious folk. And in fact, many religious folk have drafted all kinds of documents. How many of you have ever heard of a letter to Baghdad? Well, we don't have many. There's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. This is a common word between us and you. Okay. You got an A plus so far. The Imam message. We got two that are running. So he is the Imam in the main mosque. Ah! <laughs> you cheat! You cheat! You're a professional. The Marrakesh Declaration. Okay, so we got about five of us who can go out for coffee, tea, or a drink. Okay. Uh, all right. Notice how few. These are major statements. You know how people always say, "Why don't Muslims denounce?" They denounce all the time. You go on the internet, go on our website, you will see references to statements made by Muslims since 9-11 and major Muslim religious leaders and groups. That's not what media wants to put out there. The New York Times itself has a prominent uh, guy named Thomas Friedman. Twice he has said, why don't Muslims speak out over the years? His own newspaper had a full page within days after 9-11 of major Muslim leaders speaking out. But by and large, it's not covered. Take two more questions. Hello, uh, my question is, uh, who benefits? Aside from unsavory religious outlets and unsavory media outlets, what less obvious groups benefit from this hysteria? Okay. From the hysteria against Muslims, uh, are there any less obvious groups that are benefiting from this? Oh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you bring fear to people, then, I mean, the average person who's looking at certain websites, okay, and is looking at certain programs. Um, you know, uh, this is my own, I, mo I monitor occasionally some of them, most of them I watch it. You watch discussions on Sean Hannity or Ed O'Reilly. Ed O'Reilly is really bright. That's why I think it's sad with Ed. Hannity, I understand. <laughs> uh, well, his mother must be very happy. Uh, I mean, you know, in a sense that he's got a job and a real big job. Uh, but, you know, if, if that's your source of news, in other words, when you're only showing part of the picture, or as I said, if you're looking at major media in the U.S., the U.K., and Germany, and nine out of ten stories are, and you don't know a Muslim, you don't know anything about the faith, you lead a busy life, what do you, you know, what do you expect? And one of the things we never talk about 
if you want to combat extremism, we've got to look at U.S. and EU foreign policy. If we continue to support authoritarian regimes, that produces security, right? Security through oppression and repression, okay? That doesn't assure long-term stability. It doesn't assure a culture, you know, a culture of, if you will, democratization, you know, and those, and those notions. And the extent to which we've gone back, we equivocated on the Arab Spring. We then came to recognize a coup. This is documented. The Sisi government has been the most violent government in modern Egyptian history. It includes massacres of thousands of people. It includes imprisoning close to 40,000 major human rights groups who fought on this. It re reintroducing what happens in Egypt, Egyptian prisons, torture, rape, etc. We now have disappearance as in Argentina where people are disappearing. And yet there was a hearing in Congress the other day and a congressman got up and said, well, we have to declare this Muslim group a terrorist group because President Sisi himself says it's a good. And our Secretary of State has said Egypt is on the way to the path to democracy. So unless we look at that aspect too. Okay, we got, oh, let me take two more. Um, first of all, I want to say I, I too am also an Italian Catholic, so I know what it's like to have like, oh, is your grandpa from the mafia? Oh, no, he's not. He's not from the mafia. I have a button that says, good Catholic, can you tell? Oh. I don't want to get one that's Italian. Okay, Paisan, me. Anyways, uh, so you were talking about a bottom up kind of engagement between uh, everyone in religious groups and other different kind of groups. And so I just want to know what your view was on kind of ecumenical ministry between. Uh, most like say Muslims and Catholics and other Christian denominations, what would be your biggest criticism of this um, kind I of conversation? Well, I, think, I think it's great, but it's a conversation. And I think so, some of them realize it's a conversation that has to also lead to action. You know what I mean? It should be religion and action. You know, a contemplation and action. You know? uh, and I think we need to do more of that. Otherwise, to me, it's like you read a lot of books on stuff and you talk about, but you get to walk. The law, you know, and so I think that's really the most important. So I think that they can do, but I think that, that for the real change that we need, it has to be religious groups really. Again, you're seeing that now. You do have some of these groups that look like dialogue, but they don't just talk. They actually get out and do things. They work programs in communities to change people's attitudes, etc. Rather than a small group of people that get together regularly. Okay, one final. I got a, I got a quick. Uh, yeah. Could be. Uh, there's a couple of screwy things about Islam. Maybe you could clarify. How does this uh, fatwa thing work? And why does anyone follow it? And the second thing is, could you just briefly explain this, the Sunni Shiite? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll do very quick. First of all, the fatwa is not a problem. All the fatwa is, the fatwa means an opinion. It's a legal opinion. So uh, it's, it's like uh, you've got judges, let's say, then you have a trial, and then let's say, um, Let's say you've got a, a, a husband and wife want a divorce, or, or it's a commercial venture. Each side will get an outside opinion from a legal expert. Okay, in our society, we do that by getting a legal expert at Harvard or some top lawyer who writes a brief. Okay, so effectively, it's not binding. You see? Okay, but what terrorists do is they either themselves or they get a radical preacher to give a legal opinion that says it's okay to do X. Now, where it becomes a problem is. And remember this, I'll do this very briefly. Whether it's Stalin, Mao Zedong, Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush, Clinton, Obama, what they all share in common is when they go to war, none of them say, we're terrorists. You know, They all say, we're fighting against an enemy. And the enemy is bad, and that's why we're going to do whatever. And if they don't want to fight a just war, then they say, this is global terrorism. So we can waterboard. Or the other side says, oh, the Quran says it's got to be, in fact, Islamic law has regulations. It's got to be proportionate war. You cannot kill civilians. You cannot, <coughs> what they wind up saying is the enemy is so dangerous and overwhelming that all bets are off. And they get a radical preacher to do it. The Sunni Shia thing, there's a historical basis for it. Uh, but this is this is tricky, but I'll do it brief. I have a book called What Everyone Needs to Know About Islam. It's a Q and A, and I, I would recommend that to you. It's the ideal Hanukkah gift 
Happy <laughs> birthday gift, Christmas or Easter gift, whatever gift you want. When he gives birthday, whatever. It's a Q&A. But Sunni and Shia, when the Prophet died, the majority of Muslims believe that he did not designate a successor. And so people around him, some of the people who were close to him, selected somebody. Okay? And Caliph means a successor to the Prophet. A minority of people believe that the prophet's closest male relative should be his successor. Shia means the party of Ali. Okay, Ali was the senior male. He was the cousin and the son-in-law of the prophet. Okay, so there's a religious dimension. But historically, what happened was Sunnis tended to prevail historically, politically, and Shia were a minority. And so the for the Shia, it was always the sense of being a minority and a marginalized minority. You know what I mean? That the mainstream Sunni got, if you will, all the political and economic goodies, and that Shia, who should be inherited, so they saw themselves as the dispossessed and disinherited. Today, what it is, is in fact, a political situation has exacerbated these divisions. And so within Iraq, it has to do with in Iraq, you had Saddam Hussein and Sunni Muslims who represented a minority dominating for decades the Shia, marginalizing them, oppressing them, gassing them at times, etc. The problem is that when some Shia came into power, it then was, it's our turn to have, be politically dominant, economically dominant, and then you wind up, if, if, if your identity is Sunni and Shia, then when you go, when you wind up fighting, you also play off the religious difference. It's a little bit like Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland was not primarily theological with Catholics and Protestants. But it had to do with history, politics, and socioeconomic status. Okay. So then that gets played off, you know, the Sunni Shia. And what better way? Okay? Now, if I'm going to insult you in many cultures, I insult your mother or your wife. You're not going to win a war that way. Okay? But if I want to really hurt you and hurt you symbolically, First of all, I define myself as a Sunni or Shia, so you were oppressing me, so now you're the enemy, I'm going to fight you, but what better way to get at you than to blow up your mosque? And to blow it up when people are threatened, no, you know, to show that vulnerability. Just as terrorists came, when they came and attacked America, they didn't attack Idaho. They attacked our financial, the symbol, you know, the towers, and you attacked the Pentagon, and perhaps the White House. Okay, thank you all for coming. Thank <laughs> you.